its body other than the face itself. There are in fact four different types of, uh, you know, what we think of as Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Very wide, pronounced nose. There was also a very ominous uh, odor. Phase one is to identify opportunities. I walked into a small clearing uh, and less than 10, 15 feet away from uh, this enormous creature and uh, it scared the living hell out of me. Phase two is conducting investigations both of witnesses and locations. The size of the thing, it was, you know, four or five feet across the shoulders. Phase three is profiling research areas, what's there, how they move, feeding, things like that. About eight feet tall, I guessed around 800 pounds, it was massive. I had no idea that anything like that existed. Phase four is create an intercept plan. I decided to shoot in the air to see if maybe it would scare it off. Phase five is the intercept and resolve the issue phase. It didn't do anything, didn't react. And then I heard a noise from my right rear and from out behind some brush come another one and walked over by the first one. That's when I decided to do what the dog did. I took off running. Welcome to Witness of the Unknown. Hello everyone. I'm speaking with Steve in Kansas this evening. Steve, how are you doing, my friend? I'm uh, I'm doing great. Well, let's just go ahead and jump right into it. Um, before we before we started recording, you mentioned that you were going to start with uh, some experiences in Washington State. So just we'll just go ahead and um, I'll give the mic to you, and and you can take me through what all you've experienced. It sounds good. I was. Uh... Born and raised in Washington State, uh, primarily in Lewis County, uh, Thurston County. I lived in Thurston County. I, 18, I uh, went to work in the woods, and uh, I was pretty much a logger uh, out there until uh, May of 1980. And uh, I lived in the woods, and uh, you might say it was probably in the... 1960s, I uh, was introduced to Bigfoot. Uh, my dad got interested in it. Um, there was a hoaxer down in Toledo, Washington, that had a gift shop, and uh, he uh, was saying he had spotted Bigfoot and had some tracks, and come to find out he'd made them out of uh, plywood. That was Ray Wallace, and, right? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, I saw some of his stuff but, displayed down there. But that uh, that upset me a, a little bit. But my dad had a book that he read, and it was about the miners at St. Helens that uh, got attacked. And that sparked an uh, interest in me a little bit. And... Uh, but I always thought they was up in the hills and the mountains. And uh, I think it was in uh, November 1970, uh, my brother-in-law got uh, got me interested uh, in the hunting over in Yakima County, uh, just uh, south of uh, Rimrock Lake uh, up on Pine Grass Ridge and Bear Mountain. And I know the year prior to that, we were hunting pine grass. And, we had to camp down on the uh, uh, Teton River there, and at 10 o'clock at night, I heard a, uh, I thought it was the wolf that howled. It howled three times, and I was shaking my head. I mean, it, uh, it literally put the hair up on the back of my neck. And uh, at that time, I 
I didn't think we had timber wolves. And I mean, I didn't think we had wolves in Washington. I knew it wasn't a coyote. Well, anyway, that morning I had to run up over the ridge. I'd never seen any tracks or anything, but the following year we decided that we was going to hunt Bear Mountain. And, uh, I, uh, I got up there day before elk season opened up and I, uh, sent a, uh, nine man ten up and I got up there about two thirty in the afternoon and my brother and brother-in-law were supposed to show up later on that afternoon and uh it got dark I'd pick something to eat inside the tent and uh filled my thermos up with coffee and I kept hearing something walking behind the tent about 20 30 feet behind the tent and uh I knew it wasn't a raccoon. I ruled out a bear. And I got ready, and I remember crawling. Uh, nobody had showed up. And, I mean, it's dark out there. But anyway, I uh, decided, well, I'm going to go to sleep. And I crawled inside the sleeping bag, and those footsteps kept going back and forth, back and forth. And I got there, and I says, nah, I'm... Uh, I'm going to get in the car, and I did. I uh, grabbed my gun and went and sat in the front seat of the car, locked the car up, and uh, I dozed off, and about 12 o'clock, uh, they showed up. And uh, I told them what had happened, and they was about half scared to spend the night there at the tent, but we did, and got up the next morning and got a bite to eat, and at daybreak, I, uh, I took off to the... Uh, Southeast, my brother went south, my brother in law went north, and uh, we went out and hunted. And about, I'm gonna say 12 o'clock, I met my brother south of camp on the main ridge up there on Bear Mountain, and we hadn't seen anything. But we was walking back to camp, and uh, we seen these elk tracks, and they headed off over into this box canyon. I mean, there's a solid rock wall on the east side that's about 100 foot tall, one on the north side and one on the west side. And it was a good sized canyon. And those elk had barreled off down in there. And I said, let's go in there after them. I said, they don't have any place to go. And uh, my brother, I believe, is three or four years older than me. And he'd just gotten out of the Navy. And he basically taught me how to hunt. And uh, We'd take four steps, stop, look, listen. I remember I met him at 12 o'clock. At 1.30, we was almost down to the bottom of the canyon, and we'd uh, cut some fresh elk sign, and it really looked promising. And I had my hopes up. And uh, at that moment, I got there, and I says, do you feel what I feel? And he said, uh, yeah. He said, let's get the hell out of here. He's carrying 30 out six. I got a 7 mm Remington Magnum. At that particular moment, the guns didn't mean anything to us. And I turned around, and 45 minutes later, we was on top of the ridge. Uh, we didn't stop. We didn't look back. We didn't run. It was all uphill. Well, we uh, walk into camp, and my brother-in-law was there. And he was saying, hey, he said, I was just uh, talking to some elk hunters down the road here this morning. And he said, uh, there was bear hunters up here uh, last weekend camped. And he said, uh, Sasquatch, about nine foot tall, with red eyes, showed up. And he said, uh, those boys packed up and left. Well, needless to say, we did the same thing. Uh I don't know what was in that canyon, but uh, when my brother, the tone of voice, said, let's get the hell out of here, uh, I knew he was serious. And then when I uh, learned that the uh, bear hunters had been run out of there by uh, Sasquatch, well, I, uh, that was enough for me. Uh, however, I did go back back in 2005, and I did get an elk, but I stayed down on the west side on the river. I uh, No more high mountains, but uh, 
I uh, pretty much spent my life uh, out there in the woods. I uh, started out as a choker setter, worked my way up to fallen timber, and then in 78 I had a accident and pretty much put the ends to my fallen, but I did go to work for St. Regis up around, uh, up at Mineral, and uh, I got to know those mountains pretty good there, and then we transferred to uh, Tacoma, but uh, in May of 1980, I, uh, after a bad divorce, I, uh, it was suggested that I leave state, so uh, I came back here in Kansas, and uh, Bigfoot really didn't register. I uh, I bow hunted back here for uh, 30 years. I've been back here a total of 38 years now, and uh, I uh, came back here. I was, uh, after living in Washington, uh, being around uh, black bears, I I had seven encounters with black bears. I don't know what it is with being black bears, but I don't have to hunt them. Uh, they just automatically come to me. And they just uh, find you. I had two. <laughs> they do. I uh, The first one, I was about 16 years old. And I had one come charging down over on top of me, and it was about eight feet away. And uh, I stood up, I had my 30-30, and I didn't even have time to get it to my shoulder. And it hit at the bottom of that ravine. And man, it seen me and it shot off. Well then, when I was working up at St. Regis, I got hurt in a logging accident, and they had me flagging the logging trucks up there, and I sat on this log on a corner for three days. And the second day, I took my pocket knife out, and I had this piece of wood, and uh, I was carving a uh, totem pole flute. And uh, the bushlers were up on the hill, and they fired their saws up that morning. And the first tree that came down is cinnamon bear comes running down off the hillside. And I watch it jumping from log to log. And it's coming down towards me, and I didn't think too much about it. And uh, all of a sudden, it gets to the top of the bank uh, right across the road from me. And I look at it, and I start getting a little concerned. I, I got a totem pole in one hand about 16 inches long and a pocket knife in my right hand. And there's this bear. She comes down off the hill, hits the ditch, comes running directly at me. And at that moment, I just stood up, and she seen me and went running across uh, on the other side. But wow. uh, And then I've had, uh, I've seen two... Uh, Two cougars out in Washington. I had one jump across the railroad grade in front of me about 20 feet. And it came through the Sal Owl, and it was totally quiet. And uh, it didn't bother me. And then I moved back to Kansas, and I was bowman, and I wasn't scared of nothing until one evening uh, during the rut. I irritated a eight-point buck, and I got between him and the doe. Uh oh! And he literally, <laughs> he literally charged me. I was walking on this old road. I was gonna go in there and stand in the stand, and this I heard this hooves hitting the ground, and I said, "What the hell is a horse up here doing?" <laughs> and I look up, and there's this buck with his head down, and he's coming at me on a dead run. And I get there, and I just. I had a compound bow, and I just threw it down in front of me, and I held on to it with both hands. And I said, well, you're going to hit the bow before you hit my chest. He wow. came within four feet of me. He came within four feet of me, ran up on the hill about 20 yards, and stood there and looked at me broadside. Good and I Lord. was standing there. <laughs> I was shaking. And he uh, kind of twisted his tail and took off and... Needless to say, I went back in two days later and got him. But uh, you know, that's something a lot. Of, out, uh, something a lot of people don't understand that there's a lot of game 
in Kansas? Oh, I've uh, I hunted back here for thirty years, and I uh, I ended up bow hunting, and uh, I never seen another hunter, and I always got my deer every year. I I never had a problem, and um, but uh, after that, I learned that uh, I didn't uh, I didn't like to be out in the in the timber. Uh, that much uh, at dark. I mean, it's uh, you just. I don't know. It's uh, that deer incident really uh, put a little bit of fear in me. But uh, in 1995, uh, well, I lived in uh, Westmoreland, and then I moved. Uh, we moved over to uh, Holton, and it was from Potawatomi County. Uh, we moved into Jackson County. And I uh, started working at a uh, for Oldham's uh, Sausage Company, and uh, I ran across the gal, and she said that uh, she was from Valley Falls, just west of me now. But uh, she said that her mom had seen a bear, and I got there and I was, "Wow, there's no bears in Kansas," and I just put that back in my subconscious mind and. Uh, then it wasn't until 2007 I uh, I moved from Holton and I moved down here on the farm just uh, I'm a mile and a half out in the country from uh, in Mayetta and I'm a mile and a half east of the uh, Potawatomi Indian Reservation. But uh, I think it was uh, 2007 when we moved down here and I. Uh, I got hurt at work and got disabled, and uh, I had a Native American friend, and uh, he taught me how to make Native American flutes, and uh, that turned into be a hobby and uh, therapy, and later on, social life, but uh, I was making the flutes and stuff, and uh, I think it was about 2012, uh, a guy gave me a cedar chair made out of two by twos that folded up and I had a back injury and man, this chair was comfortable. So I started uh, making them and selling them. Well, I ran across the guy about 12 miles from me in Larkenburg that had a lumber yard, a hardware store and he raised cattle. And I learned that I could buy old growth cedar through him, and he had a lot of two by eights, two by sixes, two by twelves, and a lot of them was twenty foot long, and I would could get them at a good uh, price through him. And uh, we got in there, and we got talking, and uh, there's Lake Nebo there, just uh, I'd be west of. Larkenburg a little ways and he owns all the property uh, in there. He's uh, he's in the cattle business, a very successful businessman. And we got talking there one day and he said, yeah, he says, uh, I was in here with uh, the doc. I'm not going to mention the doc's name because he's currently working in Holton. But uh, he said, yeah, my son was there and he said, well, he's back in there. Uh, horseback riding and uh, he said we've seen a Bigfoot and I didn't know how to take it and then I got thinking about Darla and she told me that her mom had seen a bear in Valley Falls and this ain't but maybe 10 to 15 miles distance or maybe it could have been in the same area and I got to hmm well, I didn't think, it didn't really sink in, and, and at that particular time, I was bowing out there at Lake Nebo, and uh, it was public hunting, and I didn't think too much about it, and uh, then I was trying to think, it was about that same time I was uh, going behind the house here, I uh the house sits on 80 acres, and uh, I rent. And, but I had permission to go back there, and I would cut these uh, 
small cedar saplings and make walking sticks, and I would uh, get flute material and stuff back there. And I was on the back 80, and uh, I uh, come walking through, and I ran across this pile of scant, and I knew it had to be in, it was uh, August or September, because the uh, poke uh, berries were ripe, and uh, they're a berry that grows on a bush, and it looks like a clump of grapes, and they're purple, but they're poisonous to humans. And I found this pile of scant that was about two inches in diameter and about a foot long. And I looked at it and I scratched my head. And it says, ain't no raccoon, ain't no dog. Cows don't eat pokeberries. And I, uh, the thought crossed my mind, it's, it's got to be a Bigfoot. But it didn't sink in. And it was on that same ridge. Uh, I mean, I've hunted back here for 30 years. I covered quite a bit of territory. And I, uh, on that same ridge, just down over the hillside, there was this sapling and, and up about, I'm going to say, seven to eight feet. It was literally twisted and bent over. And the bark had separated from uh, the wood. And I got there and I scratched my head again. Uh, I was, I don't know, I just, I, I, I looked at it and I said, now that's something a tornado would do, but why would it do it in this clearing and only hit this one tree? Mm-hmm. And that, I, I get thinking about it, and I can remember being out there bow hunting and seeing these trees the same way, but uh, I was ignorant of the fact that Bigfoot still hadn't sunk in. Mm-hmm. And about a year ago, I, uh, I got interested in Bigfoot. And I got on YouTube, and I don't know how many thousands of of uh, eyewitness reports I uh, listened to, and I started putting two and two together. Well, I uh, my flutes, I uh, I make and sell Native American flutes to chairs, and I started making drums, and I go to these shows, and we've got this big show up in Sparks, Kansas. It's antique show, kind of flea market. And there's about 400, uh, 450 vendors. And so I'm up there for five days, and I made a 16-foot uh, teepee I stay in, and I had my tables out. I uh, Just for kicks and giggles, I make a little whistle that sounds like a whippoorwill, and I call it my groundhog whistle. I was over at Levensworth several years ago, and I had one, and I was blowing it, and there was a groundhog where I was set up at, there was a drainage creek in town there, and there was a groundhog burrow. And that day, I called the groundhog out of the burrow seven times. He would respond to the whistle. <laughs> so I just nicknamed it a uh, groundhog whistle. Mm-hmm. Well, then I got thinking, well, it, it worked. And, I mean, I would sell them as groundhog whistles, and, my sales really went up because these farmers back here hate groundhogs. But uh, anyway, I was there and I was uh, joking around and uh, this uh, family from Valley Falls shows up and I get talking to the mother and uh, I told her I was spiritual and stuff. She said, well, I am too. And then she brought her daughter over and all her daughter's up in her thirties now. But uh, anyway, uh, I was telling him about, hey, I got a groundhog whistle here, too. Or, and, and I mentioned, well, groundhog or Bigfoot. And she got there and she says, uh, have you seen a Bigfoot? And I said, no, but I shared my experiences out in Washington State. And she said, uh, I've seen two of them. And uh, she says they was on all fours. 
and they got up and she says, uh, it bothers me to this day. And she showed me her arms and she literally had goosebumps. And, uh, I got there and her and her mom got there and says, yeah, we see him. Well, after a little more, after getting to know the uh, family a little bit better, she ended up buying several flutes, and uh, she's got a drumming circle, and uh, I keep her supplied in her drum. She currently lives in Wichita. But uh, I got talking to her brother, and uh, he said, uh, yeah, he said, uh, I seen him. And then I talked to the uh, daughter-in-law one day. Their dad owns a... Uh, uh, shop over there and he works on motorcycles and cars a uh, very good mechanic and uh, I got talking to the daughter-in-law and she said yeah she says the whole family seen them uh, they don't talk about them I uh, I talked to the mother uh, I talked to Jill about it mm -hmm. and Angie and uh, they get there and they said uh, they're out there we leave them alone and they leave us alone and uh, that's just the way it is. They don't go out looking for them, but they know they're out there. Let me ask you, what's, and, what's the area uh, like around there? Well, it's, uh, let me, uh, let's say, I'm 45 minutes away from the Missouri River. We have the Delaware River that runs through there. It's rural America, a lot of farms. Uh, the farms are scattered out. There's a uh, there's creeks that run through the areas. There's uh, there's a lot of timber here. It's uh, rolling hills. Okay. And uh, there, there's a lot of cover. I uh, but after doing this show, I was in Mayetta, and there's a uh, antique shop. And uh, the guy is Native American that runs it. And I get in there, and uh, I get talking to him about Bigfoot. And this now, or these family that seen the Bigfoot that's in um, Jefferson County. I'm in Jackson County. But they're about 10 miles east of me. Well, I get in there, and I get talking to this guy about Bigfoot. And he said, there was a guy in here that lives on 160th Road, which is right at the end of 158th that I live on, five miles east of me. And he said he was in here, and he said he was looking out of his window, and he said this 10-foot black man, hairy man, was in his farm pond catching fish. And he just, he went nuts. I mean, he, he he would come down to the post office. He was giving them, he'd come into town once a week and get his mail. And he was giving a weekly update. <clears throat> he called the Jackson County Sheriff's Department. He called Pratt, the headquarters for Kansas Fishing Game. He called them and reported it. He called K-State and talked to some uh, professor there about it. He called KU, and then he ended up calling KBI, Kansas Bureau of Investigations. I mean, he was shook up. But come to find out, there was, was staying on each farm, and he was observing them. And he has a brother, and he was in the military. And this guy is a retired railroad worker. And from my understanding, acres. the woman that owned it, uh, that he bought it from, raised goats. Now, this area where he lives on 160th is not that far away from where these people had this sighting in Jefferson County. In fact, this guy is right on the county line. He's in Jackson County, and they're just across the highway mm -hmm. on a farm. And, I mean, it's in the same vicinity. And uh, 
anyway, uh, this guy, uh, I would go down, uh, I'd go into Mayetta and I would check with the, uh, postmaster. <laughs> and I, uh, I asked her, I says, is the guy insane? And she says, yeah, he's, he's all right. But anyway, I, uh, getting back to this guy's brother that lives up in California, he's in the military. And his brother uh, sent him this special camera. And he got it in the mail. And he said, yeah, he says, I'm, uh, I'm going to get some photos of him. He said, my brother sent me this camera. And when I get the photos, I'm supposed to send it back to him. Well, the postmaster had asked him, you, you take any photos? And he, he got there and he says, uh, I, he says, uh, I, I, I don't know. He says, I haven't taken any yet. And the guy that run the antique store asked him. He said, no, he says, I, he said, I don't, I don't know how they'll respond, but he said, they come up and he said, they knock on the window and, uh, he said, they want me to come outside, but he said, I won't go outside when they're there. And, uh, but, uh, I, uh, continued to go down, uh, in the town once a week and, and, and get an update. I could never catch him. I'd seen him one day. But uh, he didn't uh, elaborate on it. He wouldn't talk about it. And I told the guy that running the antique store, I was listening to the Cryptic Brothers down in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, they do research on the Bigfoot and stuff. And I got their phone number, and I said, well, because this guy, there was critters out there. I think he referred to them as forest people or something. He didn't really know what it was, but... There was a group of them out there, and he said one day uh, two groups showed up. There was two bunches of them, and uh, they uh, started to abuse a juvenile, and he got upset, and he called the checks and got his sheriff's department and said they're abusing this juvenile out here, and I don't know what happened, but... Uh, by this time, the postmaster in town, she's starting to shake shake her head and roll her eyes. And the last, uh, it's get, this is getting into November, and I said, I walked in and got a book of stamps, and I said, well, have you heard anything from the guy up here uh, on the farm with the Bigfoot? She said, yeah. She said he was in the other day and said that they're wearing clothes. And I kind of smiled at her. <laughs> and uh, she says, yeah, she says, I guess they broke into somebody's house and stole clothes, but uh, they're wearing clothes now. And I said, well, I said, it's possible. I said, I've heard of reports of them having blankets and stuff. I said, I guess anything is possible. And, uh, after that, he, uh, he kind of went quiet, but I, this guy that owned the antique store, not getting back to that, I, uh, I gave him the number of the cryptid brothers and this guy, I mean, he was, he didn't know where to turn to. And this was, I'm going to say about November and I got the phone number to him and he said, well, he said he took it, but he said he quit talking. He said, he won't mention anything about it. And I went into the post office and I asked her and she says, yeah, she said, uh, he said they left. Well, that would have been August, September, October, mm -hmm. November. That's about three months. And they probably de depleted their food supply and moved on. Mm -hmm. Possibly. I, I don't, I, I don't know, but, uh, now this time I'd started doing more research and I found out just west of me over on the Potawatomi Reservation on the internet, uh, BFRO, had two incidences. I think one dates back to 1965 where one was seen and the guy drives off the, <laughs> the highway and hits a clothesline. Uh -oh. uh, one right across the one right across the road in front of me. Well, then not too long ago, there was a guy working at the casino. 
and she got off shift at night and she started driving down old road south of the casino and uh, she was on the phone to her sister she was going to her sister's house and one ran out in front of the road in front of her and she hit her with a car and it broke her plastic bumper and stuff and she uh, reported that to uh, BFRO and that's where I read the report out well then I got going through there and uh, I read a report as to where there's, I think it was just last year in Jackson County, there was a dog man sighting. And uh, they, uh, the history teacher, uh, either the girl either had to be going to Holton or Hoyt. Uh, and because the history teacher said, well, you're, your home is uh, sitting on a, it's on by a Native American burial ground, an old one. And uh, they kind of linked the dog man to that, but uh, I didn't like to hear that. I, I'm still, I really don't know about the dog man. <laughs> I <laughs> guess they exist. But uh, getting Bigfoot through my uh, system is enough. Yeah, that's enough, but, right? Um, yeah, but what I've uh, what I've learned is when I'm out, uh, I reach. Uh, I do sh- uh, shows in Missouri. Uh, I used to do them in Nebraska. Now I'm just south of the Nebraska line. But when I uh, seen your uh, podcast on the uh, kid that uh, ran across the one just south of uh, Lake in Nebraska, right? Well, I do. I do two shows up there. Just south of the line in Kansas and I got there and I says wow I've been in that area and the Blue River is comes down through there but I know that area mm-hmm. and uh, it, it doesn't surprise me a bit here again it's rural America no big towns or big cities a lot of farms uh, right they've got corn they've got the corn uh they've got an abundance of deer and uh i don't know if they eat soybeans or not but i mean they've got turkey uh they they have a food abundance but uh getting back to angie the one that's seen those two and uh, this would have been back in 1990 uh she still gets goosebumps to this day and i uh we text every morning back and forth. We become pretty close friends. And I asked her, I says, uh, can you tell me uh, what type of heads did they have on them? And she said they're, they were round. She says it was a distance. She said I only seen them for a short, <laughs> a short amount of time. But it's what they did to her. And uh, me finding that pile of scamp behind the house, I know there's no animals in Kansas that can do it. Right. But wherever I wherever I go out when I'm doing my shows, I will mention Bigfoot. Uh, I go into town. I go into Walmart. I'll run across somebody. I mentioned Bigfoot, and I did this um, three weeks ago. I uh, ran across this gal that only lives two and a half miles uh, west of me uh, on a res. And I mentioned Bigfoot. And she says, I hit one a year ago. And I said, what? She says, yeah, I have the paper route. And I'm out there. And she was on P Road a mile south of where the gal hit the one on O Road. Now, the road is 134th, and you got uh, O and P that run north and south. Well, on 134th south, there's a section of land because everything is back here is pretty much divided up into one mile sections. And uh, the Native Americans have an area out there that's called no man's land, mm-hmm. and it's south of 134th. And I heard of one story uh, several years ago, a native uh, went out there. And a lot of times, I mean, they don't, they're not all Potawatomi Indians out there because they come in from other reservations and, and work out there. 
and this native uh, went into no man's land, and it's uh, got a nice creek that runs through it that flows you around, and uh, it's heavily wooded. And he went in to uh, pick uh, pawpaws, and uh, I didn't know what pawpaws were until just here recently, but they're they're sort of like a kiwi, and they grow on a uh, uh, a tree probably 12, 15 feet high, maybe 20 foot high, and uh, they in August they get ripe, and uh, they're pretty rich, and uh, I was going to go back behind my house this summer and look for him and it was hot and then thought of Bigfoot and uh, I, uh, three years ago I had two major strokes and I don't get around too good and uh, and I decided not to but anyway he he went down in there and he got his pawpaws and he left his pawpaws in there uh, I don't know what the hell he's seen hmm. uh he won't say what he's seen. Something spooked him. He will not. Something spooked him. Yeah, but all the elders say don't go in there, and nobody goes down in that area during the night. Well, this gal was out here delivering papers, and I talked to her last week. Uh, she's running the cashier, and I said, "Well, I'm going to have an interview." I said. Uh, would you like to speak up about it or anything? She said, no, I don't want nothing to do about it. She said, the only thing I can tell you is, I don't know what I hit. She said it was black, it moved fast, it had hair four inches long, and she says it stunk just like that other, the, the gal that it hit the one um, a mile north of her said that that one had put out an odor that was, mm -hmm. she didn't say what it smelled like, but she says it stunk. And she says, I don't know what it was. And she said, I didn't call anybody. She says, what are you going to tell them it, right. uh, what you hit? Right. She says, and she just had liability. It tore the uh, passenger's uh, mirror off on her car. But she still delivers papers out there, but she says, I refuse to drive the south side of that road. Wow. But I, I, I drove down there, and uh, I drove the area, and I said, yeah, there's fields here. There's a creek that flows through. It's a dense forest. There's there's some pretty there's some nice trees in there. I mean, back here an oak tree three foot. Uh, some of the sycamores are four foot. I mean they're they're fairly old forests, but nobody goes in there. And uh, I drove drove around the section, and uh, and then I uh, the same day I uh, I drove up east. Uh, up to that guy's farm, and uh, one's a low maintenance road, and I went up there and I was snooping around that night. And I've heard where these researchers go out and they uh, harass these Bigfoot, and Bigfoot shows up at their house. <laughs> well, I I don't know if there's any truth to that or not, but uh, where I live at is I got a neighbor a quarter of a mile on the. Uh, east of me and a quarter of a mile on the west of me, and I can't see them. I'm down in the ravine. And I've got a ravine that runs, uh, a creek that runs behind the house, and uh, you can walk up that ravine, and you can be standing 20 feet from the house, and I'm not going to know it. I mean, you can sneak right up and look in my living room window. But what I noticed is after I went out and I was messing around those areas, I got back in here, and I don't watch the TV anymore. I don't watch the propaganda news. So anyway, I, uh, I'm i sitting here, and it's pretty quiet, and I hear this owl outside my window. And it's it's not really a hoot. It's kind of a, a coo. Mm -hmm. And it was soft. And I got there, and I said, now, do I uh, grab my uh, flashlight and go out there and see if it's an owl? And it was cold out, and it was late, and uh, 
I took the option of going to bed. I uh, I sleep a loaded 12 gauge, and uh, it's right next to me. Uh, but the way I look at it, I'm uh, I'm disabled. I've had uh, two major strokes. I uh, I'm quarter Norwegian. I don't give up. And uh, you tell me I can't do something, and I'm gonna I'm gonna show you different. The, I, uh, I know that. Therapist. I I know that my family's from Norway. <laughs> yeah my my Lots grandfather came on. we are stubborn that's right <laughs> and uh well there was uh i remember bucota there uh they had a uh my dad was at an eagle's picnic there and they had a grease pole and uh there was a guy that was saying well uh 20 bucks for anybody that can make it to the top. And uh, my dad was there, and he said, well, he said if uh, Steve was there, he said uh, Steve would get to the top. And uh, I show up about an hour later, and they come running out, and they say, you got to climb this pole. I was going to float down the Skookumchuck River on inner tubes, and that was the only reason I went over there. And he says, uh, you got to climb this pole. you got to climb this pole. And uh, at that moment, I turned into a cat. Yeah. And I think I, I think I broke every fingernail, but uh, I made it to the top. But uh, I just learned that you don't you don't tell us that we can't do something because we're going to do it. That's but true. <laughs> I uh, I still on occasion I. Uh, the landlord, he sold this 80 acres, and I got, well, there's a new guy that owns the property, but uh, he's he's younger, and uh, he gave me permission to go back there. Well, in the spring, there's the creek, and I walk about three-quarters of the mile to the creek, and I know where all the morel mushrooms are, and I haven't told him I know where they're at. But I uh, I still go back there and uh, I walk the crook and I get my mushrooms. But uh, I'm uh, I know I'm not going to go out and go chasing them. I'm not going to go out there. I mean, when I go, one of the reasons I bow hunted for thirty years is I like to go in the woods and. Uh, I don't want nobody to know I'm in there. I just, I want to be quiet. I want to go in and I want to come out undetected. And I'm pretty much the same way when I go out. Anytime I go out, I just like to slip in and slip out. But I realize at my age and being disabled that uh, I'm a good candidate for a happy meal. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I use common sense and I just, I really need somebody to go with me. But in all the years I hunted, I was always successful being alone. But what I know now after researching, I, um, uh, I'm a little bit more skeptical about going into some of these areas mm. and, uh, yeah, you definitely I am careful. taking my phone. Yeah, and what I've uh, done about a month ago, I uh, ran up to Jackson County, the courthouse, and uh, I went in and I uh, asked him for a map. I wanted to buy a map of Jackson County, and she had the ones with all the owners and stuff on it, and I said, uh, you may think I'm crazy, but I said, I'm not going to beat around the bush. I said, we have Bigfoot in Jackson County. And I said, I want to get a map and put it on the wall, and I want to put these pins on it. And I want to keep track of where these people are seeing the Bigfoot at and what time of year. And I want to kind of try to establish a, uh, a pattern with them if I can. Mm -hmm. And I just, and that's why when I go out, uh, 
if it's at Walmart or a hardware store, I'll, I'll mention Bigfoot to people to see what a reaction I get. Sometimes sure. I get laughed at. Oh, sure. I do. I, I mean... I mean, sometimes I get laughed at. I really feel sorry for this one guy, that, that this one gal that uh, works at Walmart, and uh, she lives right in the vicinity of where all these Bigfoot are being seen. Uh, she's single, and she lives out in the country alone. And I'm at the time, I didn't know that she was single. And I says, uh, just a heads up, over there in their area you live in, I said, Bigfoot has been sighted. And uh, I said, it's pretty much confirmed. I said, the sources, the eyewitnesses I've talked to and stuff, I said, it's a very reliable source. And I said, I wouldn't let your kids out at night. I said, get them inside. And I said, I'd be careful about being outside in the country at night. And she says, well, I don't have any kids in Bigfoot. And she kind of laughed. And at that moment, I guess I, uh, I said a prayer for her because mm -hmm. those, are the, those are the people that are going to see them firsthand. Right. And they're not going to know how to respond. But I guess what I feel, I feel what a kind of a responsibility of mine is to let people be aware that we're not alone out there sure uh i went up to uh may edit today and i went into the antique shop and i was uh i wanted to see if i could catch this guy that come in to get his mail on saturday i wanted to talk to him i understood his brother came out from california and spent christmas with him and is staying with him, I think. I don't think he's gone back, but I wanted to see him. And uh, Eldon told me, no, he said he uh, he came in uh, Friday and got his mail. He said uh, he won't talk about Bigfoot anymore. He said he uh, just uh, buttoned up. And uh, I'm getting there, and I'm, I'm thinking, well, did uh, the men in black, pay him a visit because he was raised in such a ruckus but he uh he went siloed on it but i wanted to uh i know where the guy lives but the property is posted he has a steel gate across his driveway oh. it says no trespassing i think to go driving in there and say hey i'm your neighbor down the road <laughs> you, you just you don't do that if they no. got the uh, if they if they've got the property posted and no trespassing. Now, if I can catch him uptown, he's fair game. I'm going to question him. <laughs> right. But <laughs> until then, but uh, I do want to do some more. I need to do more investigating. I, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go out chasing them. I, uh, where I live, I mean, here they are five miles east of me and approximately four to five miles west of me. Uh, I'm right in between them. Right behind the house, I have a 17-acre watershed pond that is stocked with fish. I mean, there's bass and there's state record bass in there. Uh, there's channel cap. Uh, they put walleye in there. They had a crappie fishing tournament on it here several years ago. But after listening to this guy and realizing that they do go into these farm ponds and they do get fish. Now, I did learn from this guy uh, that lives east of me. In August, they was catching fish. And uh, he said uh, they're getting deer. Uh, September, he said, uh, they're killing deer now. They're eating deer now. And then uh, another comment he made that uh, threw me for a loop. He said uh, they bury their dead in the trees. He said, I seen them. He said they put their dead in the trees. Hmm. That's interesting. And, uh, well, it is. But you get thinking back to some of the Native Americans. Sure, and they, they did would that. Bury, they did that. They'd put them on scaffolds. Right. They'd put them up off the ground. And I got there and I said, well, is this, you know, this, you start linking the Native Americans with uh, Bigfoot, 
And then he mentioned the fact that uh, grandma babysits. He said grandma looks after the young ones and uh, the big ones will leave. But he said uh, grandma stays there and she sits, uh, she takes care of the juveniles. Mm -hmm. But uh, the last I heard uh, after he said that they were wearing clothes, uh, the last time I checked with the postmaster, she said, well, she said, uh, he told me, he said they left. Well, I seen the postmaster here about three weeks ago. I was uh, at a flea market, and she came over to get, uh, she was on lunch break. And I was asking her about him, and she says, uh, I won't even talk to him anymore if he mentions Bigfoot. She says, I just ignore him. And I'm sitting there saying, wow, that poor guy. I mean, this guy is was using her to get this stuff off his chest, and uh, she just totally turned him off. And uh, I haven't seen her since then, but I I do want to meet this guy. I, I don't want to go up there and snoop around very much. I I just, I have a feeling I'm not going to have to go out there and go tromping through the brush. I, I make flutes and I make drums. Uh, I don't play the flute. I mm -hmm. have the gift to make them. But you're not going to catch me being a flute player, <laughs> going out behind the house, <laughs> playing the flute, beating the drum. In fact, I won't even do it. I, uh, I've lived out here uh, 12 years now, and I have barn cats. Mm -hmm. uh, they're wild. I, I got them uh, from a friend, and uh, they, was, uh, they was wild when I got them, and I turned them loose. I feed them once a day and give them water. And mm -hmm. One of them I, uh, I could pet, but... Uh, I would, uh, I could get up to 30 cats a year, and then I'd have to thin them out. But here recently, I, uh, I can't keep cats. I, uh, the first weekend in October, I went over to Lathrop, Missouri, and uh, I was gone three days, and I ran across the gal that says, yeah, I got a neighbor that's seen a Bigfoot over there. And I'm getting that, hey, this is good. And then I had the opportunity to go up into a state park uh, one evening. Uh, some friends took me up through there, and the deer were out there eating, and all I could do was I had my eyes peeled on Bigfoot because it was in the area. I mean, it was just perfect habitat for them. But anyway, um, I got back from Lathrop, Missouri, and I was short nine cats. Wow. But I lose, on the average, of 20 cats a year, and they disappear. I don't find them. I, uh, somebody said, well, the coyotes are getting them. Well, my neighbor, he's in his 30s. Uh, he's got coyote hounds, and he turns those hounds. You never know when you're, they're going to end up down here in the yard. He told me, he said, well, they come down here. He said, you shoot them with a shotgun. He said, I don't want them down here. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not going to do it. It's not the dog's fault. Sure. I'll yell at them, and they normally leave. But, you know, if you know people who raise hounds, they, uh, they feed them enough. To, they normally feed them a high protein feed, but they keep them on the lean side so they can run. Right. And uh, they're always down there, and if they can get cat food, they're going to take it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of watch them on that. But uh, they're not getting the cats. I I don't find any signs of the cats uh, in the years pra uh, past. I had uh, 27 Muscovy ducks. Uh, every one of them within a year was gone. I wow. had two geese. And uh, I think the foxes got some of them. But the thing that, that get me is I can go walking out around in the timber, and uh, I don't find any remains. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I know we got cougar back here in Kansas. I seen one. I watched it stalk a uh, doe out in the bean field, mm -hmm. and uh, a car drove in. It was the last day of bow season, and I 
they jumped and they went through patch timber and I had to go through that patch timber to get to my boat to go across the lake and it was dark I had a self climbing tree stand on and I got there and I said oh shit and I took off I made it through the timber I got to the hay meadow and uh, <laughs> everything was good and I had a patch of timber about a hundred feet I had to walk through to get to the boat and I had a fence about three foot high well I got in about 50 foot and I jumped something and uh, my heart was up in my throat and I got there and I said oh it's a deer well I made three leaps <laughs> and it turned around and started coming back towards me. And at that moment, that uh, flight mode kicked in. I uh, I grabbed an arrow out of my quiver and I put it in my right hand. And uh, I don't remember going over the fence. I threw everything in the boat, untied it, and I got out in the lake. And that was the last time I hunted that area at night. But wow. I'm pretty sure it was the... I'm pretty sure it was the cat that I jumped it and it came back. It more than likely. Because deer don't do that. Listen, Steve, we're just and, about uh, out of time. Um, I, I'm going to have to have you back. <laughs> you have some very interesting information. And I'm going to put you in touch with well, Sean in Nebraska, too. Okay, great. I've, uh, I've heard some stories about the... Uh, Omaha Indian Reservation. They have them up there. It's just north of Omaha. But uh, I'm learning they are. Uh, they're in Missouri, uh, Nebraska, Kansas, everywhere. Uh, As a matter of fact, Sean said they're everywhere. Sean said he's uh, going to call you tomorrow. Okay, it's. Uh, I'll be home. I'm uh, retired, and I. Uh, I don't have anything better to do. I'm going to continue to investigate, and uh, I mean, I don't care if people laugh at me. I, I believe in Bigfoot. I uh, I just feel sorry for him. I I really don't want to have an encounter, but mm -hmm. uh, I think sitting here on the farm, I think I don't think I'm going to have to go to him. I uh, I don't know. I've uh, I'm going to send you some pictures of some other sign to watch for also. Okay. And then we'll, I'd like to keep in touch with you too. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm interested in this. I'm going to run over into Pottawatomie County here pretty soon. I got an area over there. I, uh, I get cedar, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to watch for tree breaks. Now I, I never, I, uh, the tree breaks got my attention as far as the teepees and stuff. Uh, I was ignorant of the fact it could have been out there and I didn't pay any attention to it. I'm, uh, I'm not one of those type of guys. And, uh, but I mean, the tree breaks did get my attention and I have seen them back here, but. Right. Okay. <clears throat> well, listen, but, we're, we're out of time, but, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to send you some information. So, uh, we'll keep in touch and I certainly appreciate you doing the interview. Well, I'm, um, I just feel people need to know that we're not alone out here. Hey, I agree. I mean, uh, uh, that one guy I was talking to today, he said they've been here forever. Right. And they have been. Mm -hmm. And then the natives, the natives out here know it. Oh yeah, they do. But they, and it's the type I have back here. Um, I want to call them the ancient ones. They're, and the reason they're not aggressive. Uh, everybody I've talked to said, uh, you leave them alone, they're going to leave you alone. Mm -hmm. And all they want to do is they want to be left alone. And I haven't heard of any aggressive, uh, reactions from them uh nobody being harassed uh other than the fact they like to run out in front of cars right. <laughs> okay <laughs> you Steve, know but uh, we're, we're gonna we're gonna get cut off okay. from them, so <laughs> we'll have to wrap it up but okay we we'll, will talk to you later okay we're, we'll talk again Take real care. soon okay okay sounds great all right okay. steve thank you have so a beautiful much beautiful evening you too my friend bye thanks everyone for joining me this week be sure to tune in again next week as we explore another account from a witness of the unknown.